Okay, so welcome to the uh, next in the set of bite-sized bioinformatics sessions. Uh, these are the sort of short, practical sessions on specific topics relating to bioinformatics that maybe don't fit within some of the other training that we do. Uh, today, I took the opportunity to take a look at something that came up uh, in a question that came to our uh, support desk uh, a little while ago, which was around fitting dose response curves, uh, and specifically how to do this in R. Uh, and I had to do a bit of research for that and play around with it a bit. And there were a number of sort of interesting things that came up on the back of that, some relating to the curves themselves, but it's also quite a nice uh, example of general data manipulation in R. Um, so what I'm going to do today is to do a practical walkthrough of uh, the data set that we're going to analyze. Uh, we're going to do some visualization of the data, some normalization of it. We're ultimately going to fit curves to it. And then we're going to compare the values from those to see if we had a change in the experiment that we performed. And then finally, we're going to check how well the model that is produced by the curve fitting fits our actual data, just to have some sort of sanity checks in there to make sure everything looks uh, the way that it should. So I'm going to do this as a walkthrough inside R Studio. So if I share my R Studio, uh, I've just got a, a blank uh, document in here at the moment, uh, and we're going to actually do this kind of all the way from first principles to look at the data. First thing I'm going to do in here is to load in the packages that I'm going to do for this. So we're going to use a few different packages in this. Uh, the one that's going to do all the actual sort of heavy lifting for doing the curve fitting itself is going to be the DRC package, the dose response curve package, which actually calculates the curves uh, and has the functions for um, building those, comparing parameter estimates from them, uh, and um, yeah, predicting uh, from the model that it builds. For the more general uh, manipulation of data, we're going to do this just within the normal tidyverse packages, which are kind of the standard way of uh, doing any kind of uh, data manipulation now. Uh, so we're going to be using bits from uh, Reader and dplyr and ggplot, but tidyverse kind of brings it all in, so that's fine, we can do that. Uh, we are going to use one function out of the broom package. So broom has uh, a number of functions which convert uh, more sort of specialized data structures into tidyverse friendly data structures. So the only thing that we're going to use out of the broom package is a function which converts the dose response curve models into something that fits with a sort of tidyverse tibble type structure. So that's all we're taking out of there. It's just a reformatting function in there. And then because we're going to draw some figures and graphs as we go through, I'm going to use my favorite ggplot theme, so I'm just going to set that at the top. Okay, So that's the basic setup. This is all we're going to use that's outside of core R. Okay. Nothing too scary in there, um, just the DRC, which is specific to this, really. We need some data to work with, and I've prepared uh, an example data set. So I'm just going to read this in. It's a tab delimited text file at the moment. So uh, I'm going to read this in, and I will save this into uh, a variable called DRC, and have a look. And this is the typical sort of structure of data that you're going to get from uh, a dose response curve experiment. So the data that we've got is that we have a set of different doses. Uh, these are serial dilutions, so you can see these are um, logarithmically spaced, so 1 times 10 to the minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, minus 10, and with some intermediate values in there, but over a very wide range of uh, concentrations. We've then done six experiments. We have C123 and E123. So the C and the E are our two experimental conditions. This is the control, uh, and this is the experiment. And then one, two, and three are just replicates. Okay, so we have controls one, two, three, and experiments one, two, three. And then we've measured a response value. So this could be whatever is relevant for the way that you've constructed your own curves. Uh, but we have a response value that associates with the different doses in here. Now, just to add some extra complexity to this uh, and to make it a bit more sort of relevant for what you get in real data, uh, we don't quite have all of the doses measured 
in all of the samples. You will see that some of the values on here are NA values, and that's because in some of the experiments, different doses were used than in others. So we're going to be building uh, dose response curves, but we're not necessarily building them off exactly the same doses in both cases. So for some doses, we have examples where our controls had them, but the experiments didn't. And down here, we have one where the experiments had them and the controls didn't. Okay, So we're going to need to deal with that uh, in our uh, data manipulation. The data at the moment is in what's called the so-called wide format, where we have all of our values sort of split into separate columns by experiment. But the general structure for doing anything in Tidyverse is that we want to have tidy format data, long format data, where each of our columns is going to represent uh, an experimental parameter and all of the data for that parameter is in that column. So the main thing that we want is that all of our response values, which is all of the numeric data in here, needs to go into a single column. Uh, and therefore, we need to restructure this to get it into this sort of long format. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do in here. OK, so if I do this, I'm going to take my DRC data and I'm going to use the tidyverse pivot longer uh, function to do the restructuring. Relatively straightforward function. Uh, requires only three bits of information. The first one is which columns of data am I going to restructure? Well, that's basically going to be all of these response columns, the C123 and the E123. So I could specify those individually or as a range, but the quicker way to specify which columns I'm restructuring is to say I'm restructuring everything except dose. Okay, So I'm not doing dose, but everything else is there. So if I say minus dose for my columns, then it's going to assume that everything else is coming in. It's going to put these columns on top of each other. So I'm going to end up building two new columns, one containing all the numbers that are in here, the values from there, and the other one containing what were the original column names from these six columns. So I just need to tell it what to call those two new columns that are going to get built. So my original column names are going to go into a new column, which I'm going to call sample. And my original values, the numbers in here, are going to go into a column which I'm going to call response. A problem I'm going to have today is I seem to be incapable of typing the word response correctly, uh, which is quite important. So at some point, doubtless, I'm going to end up with errors because I spell that incorrectly. OK, I've now restructured it. So I have the dose as a single column, the sample as a single column, and the response as a single column. So my structure is now in tidy format, uh, but I'm going to need to do some other cleaning. So now I can deal with these NA values where I didn't have the same doses in all of my experiments. So I can just remove those now because the structure that I have now doesn't expect that the, the uh, doses are going to be the same between all samples. So I can just do a filter to get rid of the NA values. So the condition I'm going to filter on is that I want my response values to not be an NA. So I only want to keep the rows where the response is not an NA. So my filter is then going to be exclamation mark for not is NA response. And that should remove all of the NA values. So at the moment, I've got 66 rows and I can see some of them are NAs. When I run this, I get down to 56 rows now, so I've got rid of those and the NAs have gone from here. So that's removed those for me. The other thing that I want to do is uh, that when I'm plotting this and indeed later on when I'm summarizing it, I want to have uh, the information in the sample here split up for me. So my sample name at the moment contains two pieces of information. The first letter in here is the uh, condition that it comes from, so the control of the experiment, and the second is the replicate number, so replicate one, two, or three. And for the way that ggplot and tidyverse are going to work, I want those in separate columns rather than conflated together in here. So I'm going to strip those out. I'm going to keep the sample column as well, uh, but I'm going to use a mutate statement to make new columns with just the um, condition or the uh, replicate in it. So my condition column is going to be the first character in sample. So I can use uh, str sub. Uh, it's going to be from the sample. 
and the sub position I want starts at character one and finishes at character one. So it's going to extract the first letter from each sample, and that's going to become the condition column. Okay, so there's my conditions now, which are just C's and A's. I also want the replicate, which is just going to be the second character. Uh, yep, yeah, indeed, Richard is pointing out in the chat, drop NA would also work for that uh, as well. Yeah, in, as in most things in R, there's more than one way to do things. Uh, so my replicate, I'm going to do with str sub from sample, and I'm going to get the second letter out of that, and that's going to give me my replicate. Okay, so there's my replicate. Now, the one other thing that I'm going to do with this is that at the moment, because I've just extracted that out as the second position in a text string, this is still a character column. So I'm going to make that into a numeric column. Uh, just so it matches the type of data a bit more. So my str sub, I'm going to wrap in a call to as numeric. So it turns it from a text column into a numeric column. So it's going to look exactly the same, but now it comes out as a double column here. So this is treated as a number. Okay, so that's my kind of restructured, filtered, cleaned up data. Haven't done anything else to it, uh, but that's going to be my cleaned up data, which I will call DRC tidy, and I can embed that in here just so I can see it as well. Okay, so data is now kind of cleaned up. Before I get into doing anything more formal, I want to visualize this. I want to plot this out. Okay, we should have dose response curves, and sometimes your curves are really nice and you can see a nice curve on it. Sometimes the experiment has not worked so well, so they're super noisy, or maybe you haven't seen any um, sort of uh, relationship between your response and your uh, dose. So we want to see what our data looks like. So I want to plot this out. I'm going to take the DRC tidy. And I am going to do a GG plot from it. I'm going to set up my aesthetics then. So my axes on my plot are going to be what you normally see on a dose response curve. So my X axis is going to be the dose. And my y axis is going to be the response. Uh, I want to plot a separate curve for every experiment. Okay, So in this case, uh, my experiments on here are the samples, Okay, because that was the experiment level I did. So I'm going to group my data by sample. So when I draw a line graph from it, the points that will get connected are the points from the same sample. But I also know that my samples come from two conditions, control and experiment. So I am going to, oops, I am going to color by condition. Okay. So how do I want to draw this? Well, I want to draw it as a line graph. So I'll add a call to geom line. Uh, but I also want to see where the data points are. So yes, the line will be there, but I want to see which bits I actually measured. So I'm going to supplement geom line with geom point. So that should give me a point line graph. I can see every measured point and then the lines that connect them. This is not a fitted curve. This is just straight lines between the points at this uh, stage. So if I do that, I'm going to get a graph that looks really ugly. Okay? And it's because most of my data is squished up against the y-axis here. My scaling on the x-axis is not great. The values that I'm putting in here are the original dose values. And the doses uh, that I used in this experiment were um, serial dilutions. So they are over a massive dynamic range. And anytime you have something like a serial dilution, your values are essentially logarithmically spaced. Okay, so the reason this plot doesn't look great is because I'm plotting a linear scale, but with data which is logarithmically spaced. I could deal with this in a number of ways. I could create a log dose variable and plot that. But actually, because I'm just using this for visualization, um, I'm just going to change the x axis to be logarithmically spaced on here. So if I use scale x log 10 uh, to make this into a log scale axis, you'll see now that my values on here are logarithmically spaced and my curves show up. Okay, so I'm 
now able to look at the data. I can see uh, some of the problems that I dealt with before in that I can see that there are places in here. I have doses that appear in one condition, but not the other. So for example, this one in the experiment is not over there, uh, but that's okay. It doesn't matter for that. I can also see that I do have nice looking curves from this. And I can already get an idea that there might be a change between the conditions in that I can see the uh, response rising earlier in the controls than it does in the experiments. And I can see the replicates mostly grouping together. So that all looks um, pretty encouraging. The one thing that I can see, which is um, probably not relevant for the measures that I'm wanting to make and which I might want to normalize away, is that the maximal response is not the same between the two conditions. I'm seeing a higher level of response, a final response in my controls than I am in my experiments. And if I'm just parameterizing the shape of the curve, then that's probably not a metric that I'm immediately interested in. Okay, it doesn't tell me about the relationship between dose and response. It's more of the final level that comes off it. So the additional uh, degree of uh, normalization that I'm going to do is that I want to normalize away the difference in the final response value at the end of the curve so that I can focus on the shapes of the curve and compare those. So I'm going to do a normalization step. Now, the way that I'm going to normalize this is that I am going to create an average value for each condition. So I'm going to average the replicates in each condition. And then I'm going to extract the highest value from any of the doses in each of the conditions. Okay? I want to find the highest value per condition. Now, in this case, that's going to end up being probably the, the final uh, dose value in here. It'll be the highest one. It doesn't have to be, but that's probably how it's going to work out. And then, then I'm going to normalize all of the individual values against that maximal value. So in essence, what I'm going to do is to scale these values between naught and 100% as you go from the lowest to the highest value in each condition. We're going to do this in steps, though. So the first step is to get those maximal values. I want to know what the highest control and the highest experiment value is after I've averaged the replicates that are in there. So I'm going to take my DRC tidy data. I'm going to do this as a grouped condition. So firstly, I want to create the average uh, values for each dose in each condition. So I'm going to group by dose and condition. Okay, So that will give me 19 combinations of dose and condition. And then I'm going to summarize. And all I need to know in my summary is I want to know the average response can, uh, value for each dose in each condition. Okay, So my response will be the mean of the response value. So because we have three replicates in each condition, it's going to be the mean of those three values. Okay, so now I've got the doses, the conditions and the mean response. So there will be no duplication of condition and dose in here. I've done a grouped operation and I've left myself grouped. So the thing to get into the habit of whenever you're doing grouped operations is as soon as you've finished with it, always ungroup so you don't accidentally leave on grouping that you're not expecting. It doesn't really matter in this instance, but it's a good habit just to have as a muscle memory in here. Now what I want to do is to find the highest response value in each condition. I don't care which dose it came from, I just want the highest response value, okay, because that's what I'm going to normalize to. So I'm going to arrange this data by descending response. Uh -huh. Again, can't spell response. Okay, so these are the highest ones. And I want the highest response for each condition. Now, I can get the highest response from all of them by just taking the first row. I've sorted high to low. Uh, but I want the first row for the controls and the first row for the experiments. So again, I can do this with a grouped operation. So if I now group by condition. Okay. Oops. Can't spell. Um, oh, uh, not group condition, group by condition. There we go. There we go. Uh, I get my two conditions, C and E. And if I now extract the first row 
from this. So if I do slice one, normally that would just give me the first row of the tibble. But because I'm grouped by condition, it's going to give me the first row from each of the subgroups defined by condition. So it's going to give me the first row from the C set of values and the first row from the E set of values. So I will get in a single operation the highest response for the control and the highest response for the experiment. Okay, bit of cleanup. Um, I can ungroup, take the grouping information off. I don't need to know the dose anymore. All I care about is the condition and the response. So I can do select for minus dose to get rid of the dose column. And then because I'm going to end up um, joining this data back to my original data, I already have a column called response. OK, and that's going to conflict with the other one. So I'm going to change this column from being called response to max response. Um, and then I know that it's a, a different type of value. So I'm just going to rename and say max response equals response. OK, so. The outcome of all of this stuff is just my highest average value for any dose in the control is 42, and the highest value for any dose in the experiment is 35. So that reflects what we see. The control goes to a higher value, it's about 42 in there, and about 35 for the experiment. Okay, and I'm going to save those. I will call those max responses. So there's my data. Now I've got those values, um, I'm going to apply them to the tidy data so that I can rescale that data between naught and the maximum response value. Okay. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to go back to my DRC, oops, DRC tidy, which is this. And what I'm going to do is a join between this and the max response. Uh, max responses table. When you're joining data sets like this, it's going to join them based on the columns whose names match between the two data sets. And the only column which matches is going to be the condition column. Okay, I've got a condition column here, and I've got a condition column there. So it's going to pair up the data in this with the data with this based on the condition. So whether it's control or experiment. And then it's going to essentially add the max response column into this data so that I get the correct max response value for the condition that I'm in. The type of join that I want to do on this is going to be a left join. That's because I want to keep all of DRC tidy. OK, I want everything that's in here. And then I want to add in whatever information I can from the max responses. OK, so you'll see that I essentially get the same data as I had before now, but now I've got the correct max response value on each row. Now that I've got that, I have the original response value and the max response value, I can calculate a normalized response value, which is simply this response value expressed as a percentage of the max response value. OK, so that's just going to be a mutate. Uh, I'm going to call, make a new column, which is going to be called norm response, and it's just going to be 100 times response divided by max response, not responses, uh, the column, not the data structure. Okay, And that will get me the normalized value, okay, it's a bit wide going off, but here's my normalized response now, and this is a percentage value of the response compared to the max response. I've now got my, all my normalized data. I just need to do a bit of cleaning up. I don't need all of the columns in here. There's various bits that I've had as intermediate values, so I can cut down to just the bits I need for the subsequent operations. So that means I need the dose, I need the sample, I need the condition, I need the replicate, and I need the normalized response. Okay, Those are the columns that are actually going to carry forward into anything else that I do. OK, so let me save that. And that's going to give me just the normalized version of this. So essentially the same structure as I had before, my dose, 
my sample, the split out condition and replicate from the sample, and now a normalized response. So now that I've done it, just to check that it's done the right thing, I can redo the same plot that I did before, but now using the normalized values. And I should see that the curves now all top out at about the same value. So let's just check that works. So my ggplot, again, my aesthetics are going to be x is going to be the dose. Uh, y is going to now be the normalized response. I still want to group by uh, sample. I still want to color by condition. I want it to be a line graph, so I'm adding geom line. I want to see the data points, so I'm going to see geom point. And I need the x-axis to be a logarithmic axis, so I'm going to scale that to uh, log 10. Okay, so very similar to what I had before, but now the global difference between the control and the experiment has gone. So if I compare what I had before up here, where the control over the experiment was lower than control to the normalized ones, now they're more similar. And we can start focusing on the difference in the curves, which is what we actually want to do. So we're going to now parameterize the curves in here uh, and compare them. Now, for the comparison that I want to do here, I am going to calculate my curve for each condition. Okay, so I'm not going to calculate every individual curve. I'm going to take the mean of the replicates for each condition and calculate the dose response curve for that condition. So my first step in here is to replicate actually the first part of what we did last time, which is just averaging the replicates for each condition so that we end up with the uh, just the doses and average values uh, for each condition. So uh, I want to use the DRC norm data. I am going to group by uh, dose and condition. And when I'm calculating the average values, I'm going to calculate not just the mean value for the response, but I'm also going to put an error bar on this. So I'm going to calculate the standard error of the mean to see how accurately uh, I've quantitated this. So I'm going to summarize this and I'm going to summarize two values. I'm going to summarize the standard error of the mean. Weirdly, there isn't in Cora uh, a standard error of the mean value. So I calculate the standard deviation of the normalized responses and then just divide that by the square root of the number of observations. So the n function just says how many rows are in the current group. And if you take the square root of that, and you take the standard deviation and divide by the square root of the number of observations, that's your standard error of the mean. And then I want my response value. And my response is just going to be the mean value of the normalized responses that I've calculated in here. Okay, so now no replicates in here, just unique combinations of dose and condition. And I can do my DRC per condition. condition. Okay. okay, so one step closer, I now have my responses for each combination of dose and condition and the standard error of the means for those. Again, it's always a good idea whenever you do any of these sort of manipulations to plot it out and to check that the plot looks sensible because it's the easiest way to spot if you've done anything weird or wrong. So let's do that. OK, so we'll take the DRC per condition. We're going to do a GG plot similar to what we've had before. So our X is going to be the dose. Our Y is going to be the, oh, I knew I was going to do it at some point. I've ended up with a response instead of a response. Oh, let's fix that. There you go, response with an S. There we go. Uh, y is going to be a response. Um, 
We want to put error bars on this. So the aesthetics that we need for error bars is a Y min and a Y max. Okay, So the, the Y on here is going to refer to the value that gets plotted for the data. But for the error bars, we need a min and a max Y so that we can draw the range. And in fact, let's spread this out a bit. So my X is going to be dose, Y is going to be response. For my error bars, my, my Y min is simply going to be the response minus the SEM. My Y max is going to be the response plus the SEM. And I'm going to color by condition. And that will actually also sort out the groups. For me, I only have two groups here. I don't need to worry about the difference between samples and conditions because I've uh, averaged those together. So that should give me my basic GG plot. And then my um, geometries are going to be the geom line to get the line graph. Geom point to get the data points on. Geom error bar, that's where the Y mins and the Y maxes are going to come from to draw my error bars on there. And then, as, as in all of these, I want to have this as a log scale X axis. Okay, not too bad. My error bars are uncomfortably wide. I don't like wide error bars, so I could make those a bit narrower set the width on them. But there we go. Now I can see the average response curves for my two conditions. I can see that the replicates are pretty similar to each other. There's a little bit of noise in between them. Uh, but that's the data that I'm going to now build my dose response curve models from and compare these two curves where it looks like there is a difference between them. So now we can get on to actually doing the curve fitting part. And for this, we're going to use uh, the DRM function from the DRC package. So DRC is the dose response curve package. And the DRM function is the dose response model function. So we can just have a... You know, we can have a look at this. So fitting dose response models, the things that we need for this, uh, we need to specify the data. Okay, so we're going to tell it the averaged uh, dose response curve normalized data that we're going to do. We need a formula. So what are we going to predict from what? Well, in our case, we want to predict the response from the dose. Okay, so that's going to be our formula. Uh, we need to know the curve ID. So the curve ID says, well, are you just predicting one curve from everything? Or are you wanting to subset your data uh, to predict curves for different subsets? And in our case, we want to predict a curve for each condition. So our curve ID is going to be the condition column because that's going to mean it's going to build a curve for the control and a curve for the experiment. Uh, we need the, oops, excuse me, the FCT value down here, which is uh, the uh, function that's actually going to calculate the model. You can calculate different types of curves with the DRC, uh, but dose response curves generally uh, are calculated off um, the logistic, uh, log standard logistic model on here. So a uh, four parameter logistic model. So uh, functions use four and five parameter log logistic functions. So LL, log logistic function. So we keep giving it linear data, but it's going to calculate it off log values. And we want the four parameter uh, one. And the only other thing that we're going to specify, just for kind of convenience, that the model that comes back, the four parameters that we get, which are the slope, the minimum, the maximum, and the EC50, um, are given really short single letter names, which isn't very nice. So the only other thing that we're going to provide to this is a slightly longer name for each of the parameters, just so it's a bit easier to read. OK, but that's how we're going to build this function. So let's put this together kind of bit by bit. So first thing we're going to specify is the data. Uh, and our data is going to be the DRC per condition. So that's the data that we've just calculated up here and plotted there. The formula for what we want it to predict 
is that we want it to predict the response from the dose. So our formula is response given dose. Okay, so standard R nomenclature for building formulas, what you're predicting, and in this case, it's a single parameter. So this is predicted by and then dose. Okay, in other contexts, you could build more complex formulas, but here we only have the two parameters. Uh, our curve ID, curve ID is going to be condition. So we have two conditions, C and E, control and experiment. So it's going to build a separate curve for each of those. Uh, and then our function is going to be the log logistic four parameter uh, function that it's going to do. And in there, I'm going to set the names of the output variables from it to slightly longer names that are more readable. So rather than just the single letters that it gives me to by default, I'm going to tell it to say, nope, the first parameter is going to be the hill slope, which is, then it's going to be the minimum value. The min and the max are going to be boring because we've just scaled this to percentage values anyway. So they're going to be something close to naught and 100. Um, and then the one that we're most going to be interested in is our EC50, so which is the dose at which we get 50% of our response. Okay. We can run that and we get our output. And it's in this sort of, sort of uh, format that DRC itself defines. So just to make it a little bit more usable and readable with what we are going to do, I'm going to save that into a variable called model. And then I am going to view it by using the tidy function, uh, which is the thing that we use the broom package for. So we, when we first loaded it in, we said, oh, yeah, we're going to use broom. This is all we're going to use it for. And the broom package will take that and turn it, in, turn it into something uh, which is a bit more readable and in sort of tidy format. So here we can see now the output of this model. We have the four parameters that it's made, the slope, the minimum, the maximum, and the EC50. We have those twice because we have them for the control and the experiment. We have the estimated value, the standard error of that, say how accurately it's measured it, and then the raw statistic off which that estimate was built, which would be different in uh, different uh, for different parameter types. Um, and we can now start comparing these values. The scientific notation in here doesn't really help with estimating these, but we know that the minimum and maximum and probably the slope are not going to be particularly interesting. If we look at these models, the minimum and the maximum, we've kind of set ourselves. They're going between 0 and 100 because we scaled this on a percentage. So those are going to be boring. The slope the rate at which it rises, these are pretty parallel. So they're not likely to be very interesting. The interesting part is going to be the EC50, which is where we get 50% inhibition on here, or 50% sorry activation in this case. Um, and those are the values that are likely to be different. And those are the ones that we want to numerically compare. So if we want to compare those values, obviously we have those values written in here. We can see that these are kind of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 and 8 times 10 to the minus 7. So we have uh, a pretty big absolute value in there uh, with uh, some level of error on it. Uh, but we can actually directly compare those. There is a function built into the package that lets us to do that. Um, so that function is comp palm so to compare parameters uh, let's just have a quick look at that and it will tell us that it compares uh, parameters uh, from uh, different assays and you can compare them in one of two ways so you can either compare them as ratios so one parameter you look at the value of one parameter divided by the other or you can compare them as differences one parameter subtracted from the other uh, so we're going to give it the model. Uh, we're going to tell it which parameter we want to compare. And then the um, operator value that we're going to put in here in this case is we are going to compare the difference in it. So we're going to subtract them from each other and see how far away that is from zero in, in essence. So we are going to do the comp palm from the model, which is the DRC model that we saved. The parameter that we're going to compare is going to be the EC50. And the, um, the operator that we want to use to compare these 
is going to be minus okay because we want to subtract and we don't want the ratio of the two we want the absolute difference in them and that now is going to give us a p-value to tell us um, whether we see a significant difference in the estimate of that parameter between the models that we made for our control and our experiment and not surprisingly we get a highly significant difference which Again, not surprising given the offset that we see in here, but this is going to give us the value that we can cite for how different those are. We have the actual values in the estimates uh, up here, uh, but this is going to give us the statistic on top of that. So we're a good way through. The final thing that I want to do is a bit of a sanity check on this. So I would like to know that the curve that it fitted to my data actually looks like my data and is a good fit through that because we haven't been able to check that so far. So the final thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get the model to predict the values for all of the doses that I have in my data. And then I'm going to plot those predicted curves against the actual values that I have. And what I should see is that the curve that it fitted sits nicely and uh, within the data that I'd actually got. So we can do this with the model that we've got. We can predict new values. We can say, right, give it, give me a, I can give it a dose and I can tell it which of the curves uh, that I wanted to predict from, and it will tell me what its estimate was for that. To do this, I need to get, build up a little data structure of predictions that I want it to make. Okay. Now, this data structure, um, we've been completely sort of immersed in tidyverse for everything, but the way that this function works, it won't work if you give it a tibble. You have to give it a base data frame for this. So essentially, it's going to look very similar, but just be aware that if you feed it a tibble, it won't work. So we need to build up a data frame of the predictions that we want it to make. So that means we need a set of doses. The doses that I'm going to give it, are gonna, I'm going to go all the way back to my original DRC data set that I had over here, where I had the full set of doses that were observed. So before I did all the tidying, I'm just going to take that column and I'm going to predict those doses um, for both of my conditions. Okay, so my dose is going to be, I'm going to do a, a repeat of DRC dose. So I'm just going to pull the dose column out of that original one. Uh, and I'm going to repeat the whole thing twice. Okay. Okay. So that's going to do all of the doses and then all of the doses again. I also need to tell it which condition it's going to predict from. And my condition is uh, just going to be uh, a set of C's and then a set of E's. Okay, so I want to predict for all of the controls and then the second lot of doses I wanted to predict for all of the experiments. So that's going to repeat C and then E. And how many times do I want it to repeat? So I want to repeat that for the number of rows in DRC. Okay, so in my original DRC, I've taken out all of the doses here. So there were 11 rows in here. So I'm going to get it to repeat C 11 times and then E 11 times. Okay, so here's my 22 row prediction uh, table, which says I want you to predict the C value at this dose and then the C value at this dose and the C value at this dose. And then if I go down, I then want you to predict the E value at all of those doses. Okay, so nothing's actually predicted yet. I'm just building up something that says what I want you to predict. Okay, so I now have a data set that says what I want to predict. And now I want to make it do that prediction. So I can do that with the standard predict function. And the predict function says, right, well, you need to give me a model. Well, that's going to be the DRC model. And you need to tell me uh, which data you want to uh, predict off. So I have this new data parameter uh, where I give it the predicted data, data frame that I made there. And what it's going to give me back are the predictions. Okay, so it's a 22 row data frame, and it's going to give me 22 predictions based off that. Now, 
I don't really want this in a vector. I want to add it back into the data structure that I made here. So I'm going to predict it that way. And then I'm going to assign this to a new column in predicted data. So I'm going to say predicted data dot uh, prediction. OK, so it's going to go in there. And now if I have a look at my predicted data, I've got my dose, and my condition, and now the actual numerical prediction from the model. OK, so this is what I'm going to compare my data to to see how well that prediction pans out. So my final thing that I'm going to do in here then is I'm going to plot my real data and then I'm going to overlay the curves from the predicted model and just check that they line up. And if they do, then we're essentially done. We've got the parameters out, we've compared them statistically, and we can now visually confirm that the models is built off the right stuff and uh, therefore that we trust it. So the base data I'm going to plot is going to be the DRC oops, per condition. So firstly, I'm just going to do the scatter plot of this. So I'll do my GG plot with my X being my dose. Oops, can't type. My Y being my response and my color being the condition. Uh, and then I will do a G on point so I can see those points and a scale X log 10. OK, so that should give me my base data. So there's the data against which I'm going to plot my curve so I can see where the data sits. Now what I want to do is to overlay the predictions from here um, so that I can see those lines. So I am going to do a geom line, but I don't want to plot that on the same data. So I'm going to do my data is now for this is the predicted data. And my aesthetics for this my X is going to be the dose, okay? And my Y is going to be the prediction. I'm still coloring by condition because that's going to be in there as well. So I don't need to specify that, but I am specifying my dose and my prediction as the X and the Y. And if I do that, there we go. This is kind of my endpoint. The lines here represent the predictions made by the model. I can see my data points on it, and I can see that the curves are a good fit for this. Um, so they're no longer just joining the points. Those are the predicted models through it. I've got my estimates of my values and the statistics that come off it to show that there is a significant difference. And I've got every visualization and metric that I think would be useful for this. OK, so that's where we're going to finish up today. Um, hopefully that's given you a pointer for the ways that you can approach it and uh, the various sort of steps of both data cleanup, restructuring, validation um, and normalization that you do before you eventually do the um, prediction of the uh, parameters. Uh, and should hopefully give you not only the answer you want and the statistics you want, but suitable plots to put in to convince the rest of the world that what you're picking out is right. So thank you for coming along. If anyone's got any questions from this, uh, please feel free to ask them now. We're quite happy to take questions. Um, you can also contact me uh, afterwards or come and see me if you have questions about any of this. Uh, but yeah, any questions now, please feel free to ask. I can see here someone. Oh, it's Alex. Hello, Alex. She unmuted herself and then it's not talking. Does Alex have a question? No, mute yourself. Okay, Alex, if you're having problems, you know where to come and find me afterwards. Okay, if there's nothing else, then thank you for coming along. Uh, this video will be uh, uploaded onto our YouTube channel uh, a little bit later on. So uh, if you wish to follow this up or watch it again afterwards, uh, then it will be available on there. And please keep your eyes open for future um, bite sized bioinformatics. Uh, talks. If you have any suggestions for topics, uh, please send those into the bioinformatics group. Uh, we are always keen to know what people would like to see on these. Uh, so if you have suggestions, send them in and we'll try and do those in future sessions. Okay. Thank you all for coming along. <laughs>